Hi everyone, Zoe Trebek here and welcome back to another to camera video. And yes, I know I fell off the wagon a bit in February where I was supposed to be doing one video per week and I've released zero videos. <laughs> January was going so well. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm going to make it up to you. So in March, I'm going to be releasing more than one video per week, probably at least two, um, because otherwise, how are we going to catch up, right? So anyway, um, I thought I'd get back to writing. And since the last writing video was 12 useful terms for character writing, today I'm going to do 12 useful terms for plot writing. So without further ado, because I know I'm going to go on and on anyway, uh, let's start with number one. So number one is the concept of plot armor. It's also referred to as a script immunity sometimes. And this is basically when one of your characters, um, for whatever reason, or possibly more of your characters in a story, um, is so important to your plot that instead of like letting anything bad happen to them, you're aware, and unfortunately your readers, or in the case of films or TV, your viewers are also aware that realistically, however much you want to paint it like they're in peril, um, nobody believes that because they're essential, that they must be there at the end of the story, which has quite clearly been you know, forecast. So um, an example of this would be um, Bink from uh, Piers Anthony's A Spell for Chameleon. It was the first book in the Xanth series. Um, another good example of people that are basically characters that cannot be touched by bad plot things. I mean, okay, things might go occasionally wrong, but you know they're going to be fine in the end. Are the, um, what are they called? The, um, is it the Tavirin? Tavirin? I think it's the Tavirin. Anyway, it's from Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time series. And so, yeah, these are, um, these are people, these all blokes, of course, um, that are like, they're just so important that the whole web of destiny um, is woven through them. And so, like, basically, destiny will twist and turn to make sure that, that they'll be okay and that they'll get to fulfill their purpose in the world. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, it becomes kind of obvious that the uh, Tavirin aren't going to suffer any, like, tremendously awful fates because they have to make it to the end of the story, at least. So um, let's go on to another uh, plot-related term, which is the retcon. Now, if you haven't heard of this, this stands for um, the retroactive continuity. And all this is is basically, usually, oftentimes, it's in a long-running series um, or TV series or series of books, whatever, where something has changed and the author is basically realizes now there's something that needs to kind of be written in to have happened earlier, um, which doesn't really fit with the continuity of everything that went before. It is definitely not matching the known canon. And so you kind of have to pretend like, oh, it was always this way, I swear to you. Um, the terms used in like a uh, tabletop role playing, um, if, if somebody does a scene, an action in a scene, and then everybody realizes that, oh, actually that can't work or, crap, I read the rules for the spell wrong, or, oh, this is going to totally mess everything up, or I didn't understand, like, the, the dungeon master maybe told something, gave some key detail, and that the players didn't catch on, pick up on that, and so they say, okay, we're going to do this, and the DM's like, um, that's going to kill all of you because I said this thing, don't you remember? And then everybody goes, actually, retcon that, we're not doing that, we're going to do this other thing. So, um, but it can be used also actually as a straight up, like, um, serious uh, narrative point, a theme. Um, for instance, in the um, in George Orwell's 1984, uh, obviously the Ministry of Truth engages in tons of retconning. It's just part of this dystopian future where basically, yeah, people get disappeared and then they never existed in the first place. And like words or phrases that once existed, it's like that no longer has any meaning. That, that phrase doesn't exist. That phrase never existed. That person never existed. So that's an example of like, um, a sinister government force retconning uh, indeed entire people, uh, entire concepts, so you can't even think those thoughts. So um, yeah, I think that's enough on, on the retcon. I mean, other authors have used it to good effect. Like I think Terry Pratchett, throughout all the Discworld novels, occasionally will retcon bits of the cartography of Discworld, primarily for humorous effect because you know, he was so good at that. Um, so let's go on to a third term, um, which is the unreliable narrator. Hopefully you've all heard this at some point. Um, these are basically, we have this assumption when we're reading a story and it's being told to us that whoever's narrating it, whether it's a first person narration or third person, is kind of giving us the straight dope on what's happening. And that can be subverted because obviously there are some stories where the person who's telling you all this 
isn't trustworthy and they've got an agenda and you'll find out later that the, the events that you were being told actually didn't happen in that way um, and this can obviously be done to very good effect um, if it's done to bad effect if like if the writer hasn't realized that their, their, um, their actual narrator isn't trustworthy until the end and then it looks a bit slipshod but famous examples would be like um, uh, Cervantes Don Quixote because obviously Don Quixote has this very different perception of the world he inhabits from what the world is actually like. But of course, he's played off by Sancho Panza. So basically, you have somebody who's like a reliable observer to the unreliable narrator. And there's a lot of good play to be had with that. Um, obviously, another famous one would be um, Baron Munchausen. Um, I think Rudolf Rasps. I can't remember, but whatever. This is um, this famous. If you've never seen the film, you should though. Um, this famous larger-than-life character who basically is recounting tales of what happened to him but of course it's all like very fanciful conceptions and in the film they play along with basically breaking the um, fourth wall a lot and also basically just kind of like this thing that happened oh actually let's come back in and redo the whole scene the way it might have happened another alternate way um i guess in fantasy well, i've got a lot of fantasy here that way um another one would be um the lord of the rings like originally the way Bilbo recounted the tale of how he came by the One Ring in The Hobbit, that gets changed a lot when basically when J.R.R. Tolkien decided that he was going to take this, this story that was set in this universe and flesh it out into this like massive saga, that this bigger universe and a larger tale to tell in The Lord of the Rings. And so yeah, suddenly it turns out that Bilbo hmm, may have been fibbing a bit, and so the way the way that J.R.R. Tolkien gets around that is to say that this was the Red Book of Westmarch, and so it was a tale there and back again told by Bilbo about his adventures. So of course you couldn't necessarily trust that to be the truth. Here's the real truth coming out in Lord of the Rings. So um, yeah, you can use it in all to various effects, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a structural plot device that you can use to make the narration more interesting and uh, to have some things that you conceal from the reader and then reveal hopefully again to good effect so that they don't feel cheated. So let's see, um, term number four, we're gonna get through these 12, I swear to you, is um, oh, the plot magnet, um, also known as a, sometimes called a magnetic plot device. So now this is a situation where either a character or a location or a scenario that normally you would run from, um, or not necessarily the character, but basically if you're in a situation, it's like, why would anyone sign up for this mission? Why would anyone do this quest? Why would anyone stay in this city if it's like constantly riddled by like zombie horrors or vampi vampires in the case of, um, is it Sunnydale? I can't remember. In Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the city, I think it's Sunnydale, has a hell mouth under it. So this explains why like there's constantly all this weird bad stuff happening. It's like, because this isn't just a normal place. There's a reason all these bad things keep happening, why people don't seem to get it and get the heck out is another matter. But um, another tried and true um, method of like dragging a unwilling protagonist um, into a story and keeping them there where normally they'd be like, see, uh, this is way too dangerous or messy or horrible, I'm out, is because um, usually the government or some secret organization is determined that they're the what is it, the world's foremost expert in this field. That, that this phrase gets overused quite a lot in, um, in fiction, in films in particular. I mean, gosh, let's think. Um, uh, Indiana Jones in Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, the government has to come to him because he's the world's foremost expert on this thing. We need to get it back from the Nazis. Um, uh, Stargate, um, I can't remember the name of the, the scientist, but he's brought in to help this team decipher the thing. In fact, deciphering seems to be a popular trope. Like, um, what's the film? Was it recently a, a rival? Arrival, which is a really good film. Again, sorry, I'm making film recommendations in the middle of this um, this writing uh, info piece. But um, yeah, basically she's just really good with languages. And so they have to come to her and basically pluck her out of her, her humdrum hum day-to-day -day -day life to go deal with this and decipher this alien, these alien glyphs in this language. So um, yeah, if basically you have to have an excuse to explain why anyone would stay in a place, why anyone would deal with the quest, why your character had would continue to be involved with something, you could call it a, a plot magnet. So now some of these can be very explicit and some can be, one that's very tropey is called um, the MacGuffin. You've probably heard of this phrase. And this is just like something that everyone is after that basically it's an object usually. And so it could be like a briefcase full of secret codes that unlock like the nuclear missile arsenal for a country. It could be like a really expensive diamond. Um, it could be, well, obviously in um, 
the Maltese Falcon. It's the actual eponymous uh, statue, this, this thing that everybody wants. And it's like, it's not important in itself, but the fact that everyone's after it makes it drive the entire plot. Um, obviously, there's other classical examples would be like the Golden Fleece that Jason the Argonauts were off sent off to like collect as um as a thing so that was just thing, thing driving the plot it's not like the golden fleece itself like was really important and was going to save the world it's just something that um was a king peleus i can't remember but somebody wanted and said jason you and your dudes go go get this for me please so yeah um like the holy grail and arthurian legend there's like tons of examples so a macguffin is just something that it's not important in and of itself but it is used to be the excuse to basically set the plot in motion and keep it in motion now there's a there's a term that isn't like that the thing that isn't driving the whole plot but is famous that you've probably heard about because I think I mentioned it in the last rating video it's called Chekhov's gun so Chekhov's gun this goes back to like a writing principle that um that Anton Chekhov uh, came up with and it's been phrased various ways but I think it was something like um that you have to remove everything that actually doesn't have core relevance to your story. Otherwise, you're just padding it out. And obviously, other writers have disagreed and said, no, you want ornamentation and frills and distractions and misdirection. But um, Anton Chekhov, I think he said something like, if in the first chapter of your story, you have a rifle mounted on the wall, then in the second or third chapter, you damn well better have that thing go off. Like, somebody has to grab it, use it. There's got to be a purpose for it, because otherwise, what's it doing? Why are you highlighting it in the description in the first place? So this obviously doesn't necessarily apply just to items. This can be, like, a bit of dialogue, a conversation, a scene, a setting, a circumstance, some bit of backstory. If you're going to take the time to put it into your story and focus the reader's attention on it, then you have to use it at some point later. It can't just be there for fluff. You can know a lot about, and you should, as a writer, you should know, like, it's like the iceberg um, metaphor. You know, probably a lot more of the iceberg should be below the surface in the case of your knowledge of your series. So yeah, you don't tell everything you know. You don't show the iceberg. You you tell what you need to the reader so they get it. And then you yourself know, like, what's behind all that. So um, yeah, the Chekhov's gun, um, Sometimes it's referred to as a principle of parsimony. So this word just means being very economical um, with words, unlike me. <laughs> but um, basically, yeah, just like only use, only like get the most done with the least is kind of the idea. Um, and this actually relates to something else, which is related called the um, Occam's razor. So Occam's razor is just, again, it's this principle of <sighs> basically you want to have the fewest assumptions to explain something. So basically this is, um. It's a term, I think it was William of Ockham. Yeah, I think this is the person who it's named after. But it, it's used broadly in science that if there's a simpler explanation for something, it's probably the right one, unless there's some evidence to show why that isn't the, um, the actual explanation. But coming up with some more elaborate or some more difficult reason or something that relies upon even more layers of assumption um, is probably not the cleanest and most correct answer. There's probably, you're probably missing something that would make that more clear. Um, or you're just like, you want to believe in this other answer. So even though it's much more complicated than this one, you're like, no, 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 it must be this. So um, you try ideally to avoid having a lot of that in your story and your writing, because if your plot relies upon a lot of weird assumptions, then okay, yeah, congratulations. You may ensure that um, your readers uh, will never guess the ending before you do your big reveal on the denouement, but at the same point, they're going to feel a bit cheated. Ideally, what you're aiming for is um, is a revelation or like a, the final denouement of your story should reveal the final ends. They should all fall into place, for ideally just after your reader has put them together themselves. You know, they're going, hold it, I bet that this is what's going to happen. You know what, and then this, maybe, and this should happen like, like ideally within pages of um, you actually revealing it in the story or in the very next chapter. It shouldn't be the case that it was so obvious from the beginning that like they, they read the book, they go, I bet at the very end of this book, this is gonna happen and that happens. But at the same point, don't obfuscate it so much that there's no way anyone could have guessed it, except you as the writer, because that's basically a bit unfair. Okay, let's crack on. I don't know how long I've been doing this video. Um, the eighth point I wanted to talk about is something called um, plot fuel, or sometimes it's whimsically referred to as hand wavium, because the concept here is that um, if you need some 
unexplained uh, or improbable technology or engineering or something um, that is essential to drive the plot of your story. Like without this concept, this cool thing that uh, doesn't exist in our world or exists but not to the level of sophistication that it does in your story universe, and then you don't actually explore it or explain it deeply in your world building, you're just like, oh yeah, everybody knows that there's faster than light space travel, or um, everybody knows that, um, but yeah, um, here, let's do two examples. Let's do, in science fiction, usually soft SF, there's, um, there's a whole anything surrounding faster than light travel, because at the moment we don't see how we could actually do that. So there's a lot of um, science fiction authors who work in the kind of space opera department um, who draw a line. And they say, I'm not going to have any faster than light travel in my stories because it doesn't make sense. There's no hard scientific basis on which this can currently work. So they'll have other ways of getting people to bridge the stars and stuff, you know, generation ships, this sort of thing. But yeah, in the case of stuff like Star Trek or Star Wars or even June, um, there are methods for traveling faster than light and um, and they're not explained. And they're just sort of, you hear a lot of, it's called techno babble. You've probably heard this term. And all this is, is that basically there's just enough talk that sounds kind of sciencey to convince you that oh yeah, these characters, they probably know how this all works. I'm sure there's definitely some technological or some rationale behind how the, how the science works. But of course there isn't. It's just there to like propel the story on its way. Ideally, you're not supposed to pay attention to it. So you're just kind of like, please move along, move along. So, um, so yeah, sometimes it's called plot fuel, but sometimes it's like hand wavium where you basically just don't want to go there. And it doesn't have to be science fiction. Like um, a lot of popular detective shows, police procedurals, CSI, um, a lot of these stories rely upon technology working in a way that we, we pretend the characters understand, but we as the audience don't understand, and in, in the real world it doesn't work that way. Like, you can't get instant DNA um, analyses, um, you can't like go into a fingerprint database and have it like, you know, scattered through like millions of people's fingerprints and come up with a perfect match. These things don't actually work this way. Um, Obviously in Blade Runner, which is kind of crossed over between police procedural and sci-fi, uh, the whole idea of like the um, enhance, this is obviously famous, like here, there's a gritty photo reflected on a mirror from this thing and another angle. Can we like zoom in, rotate it, enhance, and like get all, get all those grainy pixels out of the way and turn it into something we can use as a clue? So yeah, this would be hand wavy M again. So, um, what's the next one? Oh, um, yes, yeah, so the next term is um, unobtainium. So now, I get these terms all sound the similar, hand wavium, unobtainium. The reason I've broken this out as its own category is because um, it's kind of a specific subset of this. It's where there's an object or substance that without which your whole story would fall apart. So, um, and there's lots of these. I mean, in in super uh, hero uh, settings, like there's like, what I'm thinking, I, breaking it up by, um, what is it, Wolverine has, is it adamantium? Yeah, so basically, in the Marvel Universe, you've had adamantium kind of coating the skeleton of Wolverine. Um, Captain Marvel, Captain America, sorry, my wife would kill me. Um, Captain America's shield <laughs> is made from some vibranium alloy, so whatever vibranium is, it's you know, this rare thing that only exists in Wakanda and is being mined there and then exported to the rest of the world. But, um, yeah, so these special substances that have properties which do not exist in the real world, on which, you know, this, this character, this plot arc, it would all make no sense without, this is unobtainium. Um, there are earlier examples, like um, H.G. Wells, The First Men on the Moon. Um, I think the, the anti-gravity, like they don't use rockets to get to the moon, they use something called cavorite. So cavorite is this I, I don't know what, what you call the, um, the etymology of it, but basically it's an anti -grav It basically generates an anti-gravity field. So if you pull a plate away and like, suddenly expose it to the ground, now it's pushing the ship out off the planet and off towards the moon. Um, I mean, there's stuff like, um, there's some that have like magical properties, like in the Mistborn series by uh, Brandon Sanderson, there's uh, Atium, which lets you briefly see into the future and see all the possible permutations of what your opponent is about to do. Um, I guess the um, Oak Niven, the, um, the Ring World books, 
the, the structures, these massive structures that would structurally not be sound on their own, are made from something called scrith, which is just like the super durable, incredibly, this material that is unbelievably, um, well, God knows what it's made from. I'd have to go read the books again. But, um, and obviously Star Trek dilithium crystals, uh, the June books have spice. So without spice, you can't do the, um, the mapping through the stars and like do the, uh, the FTL stuff. So yeah, there's, um, there's tons of examples, but yeah, unobtainium is sort of like a physical manifestation of something that you're hand-waving the explanation for, but without it, your story could not work. So that's a key plot term. How many have we done now? Um, okay, we have three, three, three more. Um, so number 10 would be a plot hole. You must have heard this. It has a slightly more fanciful term sometimes, which is um, fridge logic. So fridge logic, the reason it has this term, I think it's been attributed originally to Alfred Hitchcock. I think there was a plot hole in Vertigo where someone like disappears. I think it's Madeline just disappears and there's no, like, where did she go? Um, and it's the sort of thing that in while you're watching, it's like, oh yeah, that's fine. We'll move on to this next scene and this thing's happening here. And then it's like, after you've finished either reading the book or after you finish watching the film, you're going to your fridge and like trying to get some food and you're saying, you have the door of the fridge open going, wait a second, that, that doesn't make sense. How did that even, how did that even happen? And um, basically a plot hole is something that you have a, a glaring structural issue with your story that, um, that literally you can get through, you can kind of push past it with suspension of disbelief, but there is no real explanation for it and it is a flaw that ideally shouldn't be there. So yeah, I think Alfred Hitchcock called it icebox, an icebox scene. It's like, yes, well, after you've gone home, having watched the film, you're, you're opening the icebox and getting some like cold chicken out and you're like going, hold on, that didn't actually make any sense. How did that happen? So, um, so that would be a plot hole. And if you can avoid them, all the better. I mean, sometimes you can, um, well, yeah, let's use the next term. Um, sometimes you can lampshade um, something like fridge logic or a plot hole by just saying, okay, yeah, we understand this makes no sense, but our characters in the story also recognize it makes no sense. Like, how did that happen? I don't know. Well, we got to move on because, you know, the next thing's occurring. We have to respond to it. So yeah, lampshading is a term where you imagine you take the lampshade. Basically, there's something that you realize doesn't quite work for the plot of your story, and you're going, huh, I, I still need this because I this is how I conceive the scene would work. I don't know how to do it without this thing, but yeah, I recognize this doesn't quite track. So instead of just hoping that the reader or the viewer, if it's a TV series or film, will just kind of not notice because that's not a safe bet. <laughs> your readers, your viewers will notice and go, hold on a second, and probably go right on the internet forums to complain about it. So instead of that, you want to tell them, okay, yeah, I got it. I know it's kind of, this doesn't quite make sense. So what you do is you hang a, lamp sh a lampshade on it, or sometimes it's called hanging a lantern. So it's basically saying, yeah, this thing over here that um, that kind of doesn't track, it's like, we get it. It's like, it'd be like um, the Buffy universe, like some of the um, like the characters are friends, like, why do these vampires keep coming up? Except they, they understand that there's the Hellmouth. But if something doesn't track, it's like, how did he even get that gizmo? It's like, it's a recognition from the writers to you saying that, yeah, okay, let's just pretend that this makes sense. Um, and let's move on because there's no other way of um, accounting for it. So yeah, that's called lampshading when you're like, you're drawing attention to something that normally would raise a bunch of reader complaints because obviously it defies willing suspension of disbelief. So yeah, you're just like going, let's just let's just carry on with it. And then finally, if all else fails in your story, uh, we come to the last term of today's video. Uh, don't do this, it's the deus ex machina. And so um, this is basically an abrupt um, external um, and highly convenient solution to some seemingly hopeless situation that your characters have gotten to. So basically, if it's basically a solution, a convenient solution to a problem that you haven't put in the work to solve, that your characters, your protagonists, haven't put in the work to solve. If things all fall together and come together perfectly at the end, and there's no reason for it to, if basically, if it looked like up until like the last page or the last chapter of your story or the last few minutes of this climactic scene, that there's no way the heroes can survive this, or there's no solution that's going to save the situation and 
probably the writer at this point goes, crap, I am, I'm not sure how this works either. Well, I'm just going to pull something out of my ass and um, give this solution that the, uh, the characters haven't worked for, that the story hasn't, said in, hasn't established in the world building. It's just going to be something that um, they didn't do, but will save them from the consequences of this plot that I put them on for however long. So yeah, you don't want to do this. And um, there's a famous quote by... Um, by Emma Coates, and it goes, coincidences to get your characters into trouble, they're great, cool, but coincidences to get them out are cheating. So yeah, just make sure that um, you can have complications. In fact, plot complications are great. That's another term. That should be a bonus number 13. I'm going to end the video soon. Don't panic. Um, but yeah, a, a plot complicate, a complication is something you want in your story. It's something that comes up organically that, hmm, wow, we thought that the protagonist had this under control, but how are they going to deal with this mess? This is basically, it's something that can be dealt with, but in a way that makes sense. But yeah, if you create the opposite of a complication, just give them, hand them a solution on a silver platter that they themselves haven't even come up with and doesn't track from all of their experiences over the course of the story, then yeah, that's a deus ex machina. Okay, I have again no idea how long this, I gotta set up like a stopwatch so I know, but um, hopefully you've enjoyed this video. There will be more of these, but this week I'm planning to do um, a few other categories. So I'm going to do a gaming video, uh, possibly another one on transition or LGBT stuff. And um, I was also thinking of doing dangerous uh, philosophy or politics video. Um, I'll try and start with something that maybe won't cause hundreds of people to unsubscribe from my channel. But anyway, um, please do leave me comments in the feedback if you enjoyed this and um, maybe suggest other writing related um, video topics I could do in the future, and uh, we'll see. But anyway, thank you again for watching, and um, I'll hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Well, wasn't that fun? If you agree, there's a few things you can do, like click the like button, or leave me some feedback as a comment, or subscribe if you're not already subscribed to my channel. All of these things help. And if you'd like to move beyond that and support the channel and the videos I do in a more substantive fashion, I've listed a number of sort of donation options here on this final slide. Right, I think that's about it, and I'll look forward to seeing you all in future videos. Take care.